What's up everyone? So today we actually had a really interesting video. I was really amped about doing this video. It's a comparison between Tor and between I2P, which I think has been a long time coming. Um, I learned a lot just researching this stuff. Um, so I really didn't, you know, I'm definitely not an I2P expert. I'm not even a Tor expert. Um, but I learned a lot going forward. Like, and I tried to distill that down and, you know, put it into this video. So let's get to it. So we've been talking about, you know, Tor and the Darknet on this channel for some time now. That said, Tor isn't the only Darknet that exists. There are actually a ton of them. Um, but we're not going to be covering, you know, all the different Darknets that exist in this video. It's definitely all the time for it. So it's an I2P and Tor video. Um, but at the end of the day, like, I'm not, I'm not really rooting for either. I just... Yeah, you know, I wanted to know kind of about both. Now, they'll be like, oh, he's, you know, look. He's got a tour shirt on. <laughs> so, I have a tour shirt on. Um, but one, because when I was at DEF CON, my wife bought it for me. Um, but two, I didn't have an I2P shirt to put on. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> there's that. Uh, I definitely have to get one of those, though. Um, especially with the content that's, you know, in this video. Um, we'll start out with the most dry stuff so we can get that out of the way and get to the cool stuff. So, vocabulary. Um, you know, before we get into it, let's look at the difference in terms between the two. We're not going to get carried away here, but, you know, there are a few really distinct keywords that are different. Uh, so, so, for example, you know, what we call a circuit in Tor, we call a tunnel in I2P. What we call a directory in Tor... We call a net B in I2P. A directory server in Tor is called the flood fill router in I2P, which sounds way more fun than its Tor counterpart. Um, Tor's entry nodes are in proxies in I2P, and an exit node in Tor is an out proxy in I2P. When we talk about hidden services in Tor, everyone knows what we're talking about. Um, in I2P, it's called the same thing, but they also call them um, I2P sites or EAP sites or, you know, um, destinations, uh, I guess. A node in Tor is a router in I2P. Okay, so you made it through that. Let's look at the less dry differences between I2P and Tor. Routing. So, this is a big one. With Tor, you, you know, have what they call onion routing, and... With I2P, you have what they call garlic routing. So, what's the difference? Well, Tor uses a centralized routing model where a user's data is passed through a series of volunteer-run nodes before reaching its destination. I2P, on the other hand, uses a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer routing model, which basically means there's no central point of control or of failure, if, you know, for that you know, matter, um, in the network, which is pretty freaking awesome. Um, but what's all that mean? Um, well, in this diagram that we can see, you can see the differences between the two. The cool part of all these things lie in the encryption. So let's look at that next. Encryption. So Tor encrypts traffic between the user's device and the first relay in the circuit, but not to the final destination. At the same time, I2P provides end-to-end -end encryption for all communications within the I2P network. So what's that mean? Tor uses two-way encrypted connections between each relay while I2P uses one-way connections between every server in its tunnel. That's great, Sam, but who really cares? Well, I2P's approach means that an attacker needs to compromise twice as many nodes in order to get the same amount of data that he would get in Tor by compromising half of those nodes, which is pretty awesome. So we all know that we can hop on the clear net with Tor if you so wish, you know, you could be watching this video right now on YouTube with Tor. Um, that said, I don't suggest it, and it would be, you know, pretty lame uh, on your part to, to do that, uh, especially considering 
all the nodes are volunteers. But um, in other words, using Tor can you know, you can still access the the ClearNet and the websites that you generally access with your standard web browser. That said, with I2P, this isn't the case. I2P can only access a separate anonymous network called the I2P network. So, while Tor is designed to provide anonymity for general web browsing and other internet activity, I2P is more optimized for anonymous file sharing and other peer-to-peer -peer activities that exist. This goes back to the onion routing we were discussing that provides anonymity versus I2P's garlic routing that we discussed earlier. Some other more technical differences that we see regarding the design of each is that Tor is primarily designed to use the TCP protocol, while I2P, on the other hand, is designed to be used with UDP protocol. Now, the differences between the two could be literally a whole separate video and hours of videos. Um, so if, if you are out there and are into hacking, there's probably a good chance that you've used programs like TorGhost, which is awesome. Um, make sure you start that repository in GitHub. For those of you who are not complete nerds, you know, like myself, um, this program works inside of Linux and, you know, basically what it does is it redirects all of your traffic through Tor. This is useful if you do things like penetration tests in order to, you know, hide your identity. Uh, if you're, you know, doing a penetration test in a covert manner, that's important to you. Um, so what's my point? Well, my point is that with Tor, you can use it to handle almost any applications traffic, which is pretty awesome. But that's not true with I2P. It can only handle specific application traffic. You can't simply route everything through I2P and magically, you know, be anonymous. Um, this goes back to the earlier point that I2P only has access to its network, not necessarily to the clearnet. Community and governance. This is a big one. So let's look at some of the differences between I2P and Tor. Regarding who runs what, who's involved. So Tor is run by a nonprofit organization called the Tor Project, Big Shock. They're responsible for developing and maintaining the Tor software. In addition, there are volunteers worldwide that run things like, you know, relays, which make up the network and at the same time enable users to browse the internet anonymously. While I2P is a little bit different. I2P, or the Invisible Internet Project, is run by a community of developers and users. No specific organization or individual runs the entire I2P network, which is great. Instead, it's maintained and developed by a decentralized group of volunteers who contribute to the project through things like coding and documentation and, you know, other forms of support that exist. Users and developers join the community to make the network more robust. Almost everybody watching this video will most likely be familiar in some way with the Tor community or Tor in general or the Darknet community or even if it's just, you know, because they, you know, have watched a ton of my videos. Um, so that said, when it comes to things like size, there is a massive, massive difference between Tor and I2P. First, nobody actually knows the exact number uh, in, in regards to the difference because both networks are, you know, anonymous overlay networks. So this makes things like usage statistics for these networks very, very difficult or, you know, impossible uh, to track. You know, unless you're the NSA um, and own a bunch of them, uh, in regards to Tor anyways. The Tor project has estimated millions of people use the network daily. At the same time, I2P, on the other hand, 
is not as popular and typically is only used by smaller groups of users like privacy enthusiasts and activists and dissidents. Um, you know, pretty much people living in countries with high censorship and surveillance. So next, we come to an interesting question. Who pays for all this? <laughs> well, if we're talking about Tor, the answer is the United States government funds Tor. Uh, and, you know, private companies and, you know, civilians and you know, hackers and uh, all that kind of stuff. It's community. Um, and with I2P, its funds come from its community and cryptocurrency. Um, so if I were to know absolutely nothing else about either I2P or Tor, aside from where they get their funding, um, to me it would be a paramount question to ask, you know, regarding how safe I feel using that software to begin with. Um, so that said, the feeling of safety is, you know, hardly relevant. I totally get that one, you know, is discussing security. Feeling safe is counterintuitive to things like cybersecurity and information security. You know, I would honestly much rather have individuals not feel safe and constantly be questioning and evaluating security and going over it constantly. Um, Never not be afraid! I th anyways, I think funding is relevant to the topic at hand, though. Uh, now, if you were to hop on YouTube and look up, you know, Tor in general, most likely you would come across a bunch of ignorant nonsense. What I mean by that is there are a ton of creators on YouTube that on their channels, they proliferate this nonsensical view and views and false views of Tor and the dark net in general, you know. Um, this is, you know, evidenced by the morons that are constantly uploading alien videos and, you know, super scary dark net videos. Um, it just drives me absolutely insane. These idiots do a massive, massive disservice to the Tor project in general. Um, with this fake and ignorant claim regarding the content of the deep web and the dark net. And, you know, it leads other people to believe what they see on YouTube, you know, is like the law um, instead of what it really is. You know, some dimwit's idea of entertainment. Now, unfortunately, over time, Tor is now associated with things like the dark web and... That connection is, you know, rooted in concrete and reinforced in steel. And I definitely don't help it being on here talking about the dark net and drugs and everything else. But at least what I say is true. Um, you would be hard pressed to find anyone nowadays who would tell you that Tor is like, you know, something that's used for legal processes or practices. That's it. There are a ton of people that, in fact, I would argue, you know, most of the people who use Tor use it for legitimate purposes, mainly centered around things like privacy and security. Um, again, because it's, you know, an anonymity network, this is not something that, like, I can prove. Um, still, I know the general statistics regarding Tor usage and the people that I personally seen, you know, on darknet markets. Now, with that said, I2P is not associated with any of that crap, you know, as none of those perceptions. There are, like, no natural negative, there are no negative connotations when it comes to I2P. And we briefly talked about routing in a previous section, so let's take a swift look at the network structure, you know, compared to Tor. Network structure. So... Tor is a global network of nodes. This isn't debatable by anyone. Unfortunately for I2P, it has a much smaller but decentralized network. For now, anyway, you know. Um, many nation states actively attempt to try and block Tor exit nodes, for example. Russia is a major, major proponent of this. Um, and as, you know, one of the Tor 
developers talked specifically about Russia trying to block Tor um, at DEF CON 30. And like, it was really, really cool. I was actually lucky enough to, to be there and to, to meet him and to be able to catch his awesome talk live. Um, if I remember, I'll put the link down in the description for his video. Anyways, I highly suggest you give it a watch if you're into, the, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, but unlike Tor, I2P nodes don't experience the same discrimination. Um, many people claim that a VPN is, you know, useful with Tor for specific use cases. Remember that most of those use cases, you know, don't involve things like the darknet. Um, but other specific use cases, this is why... By and large, I discourage, you know, using a VPN with Tor, not on its own. This is not just like my opinion. The Tor developers have also stated that, you know, using additional links in the chain, like a VPN or a proxy, the vast majority of the time is like harmful to your anonymity if you're not like a, you know, a master wizard expert. Um, and therefore, you know, you should avoid it. That said, that's not the case, you know, for all use cases. Um, can anonymity network be discovered by analyzing network meta metadata? I2P and anonymity networks are more challenging to discover. When we're discussing Tor's anonymity, it's based in part on the fact that no single node knows the complete path of a connection. I2P's anonymity, on the other hand, is based on the fact that no single node knows a connection's origin and destination. Tor provides exit nodes that provide a gateway to the internet, while I2P does not offer exit nodes. That said, with you know some slight modifications, you can combine the two to utilize Tor's exit nodes if you wish to use like I2P over Tor which is really cool. Um, but anyways, moving on. Security and anonymity. So we've already covered that Tor is much larger than I2P, not only as a network, but as a community, you know, as a whole um, as well. That said, it's also by and large faster uh, than I2P as well. Uh, but, you know, really this depends on a myriad of, you know, different things. I2P's anonymity is more secure for servers, where Tor is more secure for clients. This is good news for those who want to do things like operate EAP sites that are illegal or darknet markets, or Tor users out there um, who want to use those sites. Onion sites, now when it comes to attacks, we start to see a very positive shine through when we talk about I2P, we start to see a lot of positive when we talk about I2P, when we talk about attacks on markets. I2P, by and large, is better for anonymity and is less susceptible to various attacks. So, for example, Tor's anonymity can be compromised by an attacker who controls both the entry node and the exit node of a connection. You're not going to see this issue in I2P, most likely, also, attackers with many resources, for example, the NSA, can, you know, compromise Tor's anonymity because they can monitor a large portion of the traffic. In contrast, I2P's anonymity is much more robust against that specific type of attack. The weak link in Tor, the node that has the worst security, is the best protection in that specific chain. The most vulnerable node, basically, is, is what you're basing your OPSEC on. I2P is far more robust and resilient and is not a, the whim of the least secure, you know, router or, you know, node in that case. We're talking about Tor. As we discussed earlier, Tor is much more extensive and faster. Unfortunately, though, Tor also has a much larger attack surface in contrast. I2P is designed to be more secure against attacks, attacks like, you know, traffic correlation, which are more effective. Um, attacks like, 
traffic correlation are much more effective by default. I2P is designed to make things like, you know, traffic correlation attacks way more difficult. Uh, for those of you that are scratching your head, a uh, correlation attack or traffic correlation attack is known is a way for someone to try and figure out who is using a, the Tor network and, you know, what they're looking at specifically. Imagine, like, for example, that you and your friends decide, you know, you want to play a game of hide and seek. Your friends are hiding in different places, you know, all around the neighborhood. And, you know, the person who is it might be able to do things to, you know, figure out where everyone's hiding. By doing things like, you know, following the sound of their footsteps or, you know, looking for clues like, you know, footprints or, you know, things like that. Um, while on the Tor network, there's a lot of, you know, quote unquote foot traffic, you know, to use our metaphor or whatever, um, in the form of data packets going from one place to another place. An attacker who can see both the traffic going into the Tor network and the traffic that leaves the Tor network can try to match up those packets and figure out, you know, who's talking to whom. Like matching up a bullet, you know, it's been shot out of a rifle uh, barrel. Um, so, aside from traffic correlation attacks, Tor also uses a centralized directory. A centralized directory to maintain a list of nodes, while I2P differs because... It uses a distributed peer-to-peer -peer network to discover nodes instead. Both Tor and I2P have their, you know, form of hidden services, which allow a website or server to, you know, disguise, hide, or obfuscate its IP address at the end of the day when talking about things like security and anonymity, you know, it depends on a few central nodes while I2P, again, is more robust and resilient. And, you know, on top of that, in addition, like I2P may also have a lower risk of things like IP discovery, which is massive um, as it uses self-signed certificates for node identification, while Tor can have a higher risk of endpoint discovery as it requires unencrypted data at the exit node. You know, regarding security, I think the cards are definitely stacked in I2P's favor on the issue. For example, I2P has a lower risk of, you know, man-in-the-middle attacks as it, as it uses in-network encryption to protect data while that data is in transit. Adversaries like the NSA um, or other intelligence agencies or adversaries who have a lot of money or reach much of the time have you know dominated the tor network by creating multiple nodes and you know running them um as a global passive adversary who you know finds it a bit more challenging to do this in i2p as it uses those decentralized and kind of self-organizing you know network structure um so lastly i2p has a lower risk of exit node compromise as it you know it doesn't rely on like that centralized exit node system you know like tor does usability so tor has i2b you know definitely when it comes to usability anyone including you know grandma can easily download install and run the tor browser the overhead and time consumption is like five minutes you know if you've never done it before um, it's super easy to do. I2P, you know, on the other hand, kind of requires a little bit more technical knowledge to be able to use it and get it up and running. I2P is, you know, also definitely limited to specific platforms. We, you know, kind of talked about this earlier. There is no massive community out there that has like, you know, multiple operating systems set up um, and pre-configured for the use of I2P, you know, like Tor definitely does. You know, say like Tails, for example. Um, I think this will change uh, in the future. Uh, definitely when, you know, people use I2P more often. We see a limit of people use, utilizing I2P for third-party tools. Again, this is mainly, as we discussed, there's, you know, no real support 
with third-party tools regarding IGP. Tor is the total opposite. You can run almost anything through Tor, from hacking tools to complete operating systems. Um, Tor may, you know, have a high risk of malicious nodes due to its more extensive user base and open access in contrast. Okay, so all this is well and great, but like, you know, at the end of the day, which is better? Because that question, you know, is ironically, it's non-existent at the end of the day. Um, really, at the end of the day, it depends on who you are, why you're using the tools, you know, what you're doing, um, and like what you hope to accomplish. Um, each tool or network, you know, has its strengths and its weaknesses. The best choice at the end of the day for you will depend on your specific needs and, you know, requirements. Typically, though, I2P will offer better performance, you know, because at the end of the day, it's a peer-to-peer, -peer, you know, network. So it's like, it has, like, by the law of nature, it's like low latency, you know? See, use cases. Tor and I2P are helpful for different use cases and, you know, scenarios depending on your specific needs and goals. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Tor is typically good for, you know, general web browsing, bypassing censorship, and, you know, like hiding your location, um, and or your identity. Um, and like, you know, it allows you to do this with relative ease and a, you know, quick and easy setup, uh, pretty much. Um, you can also download multiple Linux distributions that are like specifically pre-configured to like fully utilize Tor um, to its full potential. While, you know, we can still do a lot of the same stuff on I2P that you can do on Tor, there are a variety of things that like you can't do. You know, like, you know, using the clearnet sites, which, you know, we discussed previously. That said, I2P, like, is helpful for anonymous file sharing and peer-to-peer -peer communication. Um, and, you know, for that matter, accessing hidden services on I2P is, you know, not really made to be browsing on the clearnet. Other networks or darknet networks. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that there are a ton of other dark nets out there that exist. Um, you know, Tor and I2P are not the only two that exist. Uh, they, they are the two that we focused on in this video. Um, however, they are, you know, there are well over like, you know, 10 other dark nets that are much less popular. However, that said, um, the fact that there are so many other dark nets uh, that do exist offers some insight into the fact that if there were ever like a significant issue with Tor that made it, you know, unusable, and then another major issue with I2P that also made it unusable, so super highly unlikely, um, like, there would still be a good amount of options for individuals to resort to, you know, um, to have secure and anonymous communications with each other for, like, whatever the hell purpose that they might require. In closing, I would say that at the end of the day, Tor and I2P can help protect your privacy, but, you know, are not 100% secure and can absolutely be vulnerable to various security risks. Just remember at the end of the day, your security is your security. That means it's your problem. It's your job to research and ensure that you know what you're doing when you're doing it. It's your job to ensure that you're secure when using, you know, these various different technologies. It's your operational security. Depending on your actions, you know, slacking in that realm could cost you, you know, potentially decades in a federal facility. You don't want to be there. Um, I didn't say this to scare you. I say it because it's essential to be aware of these risks and to take steps to actively protect yourself. Learn about operational security. 
and avoid taking needless or stupid risks. Also, don't rely on anyone. Taking everything I said, you know, now and like try to just prove it. Um, in doing that, you will learn that it's accurate and in turn, it will confirm the information, you know, for yourself. Reviewing it this way will help you learn, you know, more about the subject just in general. Um, and if you find I'm wrong, like point it out because I want to know. I'd like to learn. I don't take a, take offense to it or take a personal. Um, this should be your first move, like when looking at operational security, is to try to disprove stuff. And, you know, that goes back to the saying, always verify, never trust. And just say that over again, 10 more times. Um, anyways, I hope you guys, you know, like the video. Um, hit that thumbs up button um, so that this content will be promoted and made available to others vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, you know, YouTube. And, you know, if you weren't subscribed, please hit that subscribe button and hit the bell um, to be alerted when I post new content. Stay safe and I will see you guys in the next video.